Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, welcome. Welcome to the Maison Française and to this uh, lecture. Um, my name is Emily Apter, and I'm standing in for uh, the chair of the French department, Philip Usher, um, actually working as associate chair with him this semester. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our this evening's speaker, Professor Annette Joseph Gabriel, who is currently assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of French. Her research focuses on Africa and the Caribbean, with special emphasis on Afro-diasporas and slavery in the French Atlantic. And the title of her lecture is Black Women, Citizenship, and France's Universalist Myths. Combining a talent for historical excavation in her research on Black women freedom fighters in the French resistance, several of whom went on to careers in the French parliament. With her broad vision of pan-Africanism and anti-colonial struggles, Professor Annette Joseph Gabriel illuminates the vital connections between histories of activism and the redefinition of citizenship, so often a cover term for false universalisms and systemic racism. In her recently published book, Reimagining Liberation, how Black Women Transformed Citizenship in the French Empire, which came out in, with the University of Illinois Press in 2020. She animates the so often unknown and, and under-recognized biographies of Black women political figures who counseled leaders of newly independent nations, um, some of them in Ghana, Ghana, Guinea, and Congo. And she's written also about this in a series of uh, articles for Al Jazeera and for the Huffington Post. What emerges is an international, intersectionalized French political landscape, expanded beyond the parameters of, of post-colonial theory in, in a very conventional sense and siloed disciplines. Professor Annette Joseph Gabriel has explored a range of related but distinct topics in articles and essays, one titled The Spectacle of Belonging, Henri Bergson's Comic Negro and the Impossibility of Place in the Metropole. This came out in a 2019 collection examining the role of colonialism uh, and race, or the, 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 the topics of colonial and race through a Bergsonian lens. Another piece titled Mobility and the Annunciation of Freedom in Urban Saint-Domingue came out in 18th century French studies in 2017. And yet another essay, which is of particular interest uh, to me, given my own work in translation theory, is called Creolizing Freedom, French Creole Translations of Liberty and Equality in the Haitian Revolution. Um, it offers a phil philologically nuanced reading of these French revolutionary key words. Professor Joseph Gabriel's work makes an important contribution to French Atlantic studies and the contemporary Afro diaspora. Building on the articles that I just mentioned in her next book, she will explore notions of freedom in the lives of enslaved people writing in French. This study promises to be extremely timely and important to many scholars working through the creolized, vernacularized expressions of free, expression of freedom speech across continents, linguistic habitus, and the historical conditions of racial inequality. So please join me uh, and in welcoming Professor Annette Joseph Gabriel. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Emily, for the kind introduction um, and for stepping in to moderate the conversation today. Um, I also want to thank Philip Usher for the original invitation to um, come to speak at NYU. I'll be virtually. Um, and my gratitude also goes to the Maison Francaise staff for the expert handling of logistics, uh, particularly the tech, and to everyone who has joined us today from near and far. Um, and so in, in thinking with you all today about Black women citizenship and French universalism, and I think this is the first time I've ever kind of stuck to a talk title that I proposed months in advance, because these things are so timely. Um, I want to take as my starting point 
one of the arresting images of our current moment. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and I, I hope that you'll be able to see me and my PowerPoint. Okay. Um, all right. So hopefully everyone can see my PowerPoint. If you can't, someone send me a message in the chat so that I know what's going on. Um, right. But I, I want to begin with, with one of the, the arresting um, images of our current moment to ask very simply, what does it mean to say Black Lives Matter in a country that claims to not see race, right? And I'm hyper aware of the kind of the bilingual right nature of what's happening in, in the photograph that you have in front of you, um, you know, and I'm happy to kind of talk about that in Q&A. But what does it mean to say les vies noires comptent in a country whose National Assembly voted unanimously to simultaneously prohibit gender discrimination in its constitution and remove the word race from the constitution in the firm belief that the absence of race is the absence of racism. In the last few months, France has had to reckon with its colonial past in new ways as protests demanding accountability for and an end to police violence kind of started to include also defacing and toppling monuments to white French historical figures who played varying roles in the colonial enterprise in the metropole and in overseas France. And so, you know, if you'll recall from Paris, uh, you know, to, to Martinique, a host of statues were targeted, Colbert in Paris, um, in Martinique, a number of statues came down, um, Victor Schelcher, Josephine de Beauharnais, um, Pierre Bilan de Stambouc, right? People who played really varying roles in the colonial enterprise. And so in response to that last week, the Paris mayor's office announced a new project to name a public garden after La Mulatresse Solitude, an enslaved woman who participated in an armed insurrection in Guadeloupe against Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, reinstatement of slavery. Uh, this commemorative project is also supposed to involve a statue that's going to be constructed in the long term. And so even if we cautiously celebrate this initiative, there is also much that we might ask or consider about this memorial garden and statue. We might consider in what ways this is a gesture of inclusion into the landscape of Paris, a colonial city, instead of a meaningful remaking of that colonial city. Right? So when we think about the way that the history of colonialism is is etched in the very landscape of Paris, right? In the divide between center and periphery, um, in the different terms on which people can be mobile between center and periphery or even within the center, right? So I'm thinking particularly about the racialized nature of stop and frisk in Paris, for example, um, right? So we might consider into what Paris is solitude going to enter. And we might also consider France's track record of monuments to its colonial history that are adept at remembering resistance, all the while disappearing that which was being resisted. So what does it mean to say Black Lives Matter in a country that does not see race? What I would like to consider with you all today is one of the things that I see tying together the strands that you see on your screen, right? And so the strands being the movement against state-sanctioned violence and second-class citizenship for Afro-French people, um, uh, the strand being France's own attempts to grapple with its colonial past, right? And that unifying thread for me, or one of those unifying threads, is the centrality of Black French women. Solitude and Assa Traoré stand on two ends of a long genealogy of Black women's political thought and activism that affirm the value of Black life and the humanity of Black people in the face of state-sanctioned violence and death. In this genealogy, I find the work of two Black French women in particular to speak to our current moment, Jeanne Vial and Suzanne Césaire. In their writings, we find ideas about French citizenship that are timely for us today in the sense that they are pertinent to the upheaval of our present moment. And we find visions of Black French citizenship that are untimely in the way that scholars such as Gary Wilder and Nick Nesbitt have thought about untimely political visions as ones that remain unimaginable for many. 
in the moment in which they are articulated. And so there are elements of Vyas and Fizial's political visions for full citizenship for Black French people that remain unimaginable even today for a French state that hews closely to a limited and I think ultimately untenable definition of universalism. What Vial and Césaire work their way towards in their writing is a proposed model of French citizenship that refuses the colonial mandate of assimilation that's today just kind of rebranded as integration. Um, it's a model that places the possibility of Black life, Black representation, Black creativity at the heart of a reimagined France. And so I'll start with a brief biography of Vial um, because she's not as well known as Césia, who herself is relatively not well known. Um, and so Jeanne Vial was born in Ueso in Congo Brazzaville uh, on 27th August 1906. Her father was an ivory and rubber trader in Central Africa. He took her to um, France at the age of seven. Uh, later on, Vial went on to work as a journalist for Opéra Mundi and a correspondent for newspapers in French West Africa. When World War II began, she moved from Paris to Marseille, where she worked as a clandestine agent for Jean Gemali, who was head of information services for the Provence Côte d'Azur regional branch of Comba. Um, and Comba was one of the three major resistance movements in the south of France. Vial was arrested in January 1943. And at that point of her arrest, Vichy police um, interrogators kind of discovered that in her role in the French resistance, she handled large amounts of sensitive information that she had expertly categorized and coded in language that Vichy police could not decipher. And so what you see on your screen here um, is the long list of documents that they found when they raided her home in Marseille. Um, so she had information on like, you know, train schedules and movement of trains. She had information about Charles de Gaulle's plans and exile. Um, she had information about who in the resistance movement was a police informant for Vichy police, right? So Vial was involved in like running counter surveillance on state surveillance. Um, and we know all of this from Jean Guimaline's testimony. Um, and I, I don't say this to kind of downplay the horrors of, you know, Nazi interrogation, but of the six people who were arrested on that day with Vial, all of them gave pages and pages of testimony. And Vial just kept saying one sentence over and over again, je désire m'expliquer en présence d'un avocat, right? She just kept asking for her lawyer over and over again. Um, ultimately, she was interned for four months in the Brent's women's concentration camp and then transferred to the Beaumet's women's prison in Marseille until December 1943. Now here we have two competing accounts in the archives of what happened next. Um, some sources indicate that Vial was released from prison. Other sources indicate that she was involved in some kind of prison break and escaped from prison. Um, and yet other sources suggest that both of those things are true, right? So that she was arrested, incarcerated, broke out of prison, was then scooped up again, stood trial, and then was released. I can't quite figure out which of these narratives are true or what really happened, right, what the timeline is. Um, but I think that the opacity, right, surrounding this period in her life is there for good reason, right? That survival strategy of escaping the detection of state surveillance is kind of playing out in real time in the archives. And so today, Jeanne Vial's trial proceedings and case file are the only records, at least that I'm aware of, and I'd love to know if there are more, um, of a Black French woman in a concentration camp during World War II. These documents remain sealed, and they're accessible only with special permission from the French government. So what you see on your screen here, um, and let me just kind of make sure Okay, everyone can see my PowerPoint, excellent. So right, what you see on your screen here um, is a letter that I received from the French Minister of Culture um, in response to my petition to be able to access Vial's records. Um, so, you know, that request goes through the president of the Conseil General of the Bouche du Rhône region, and then goes up to the Minister of Culture who granted me access to look at Vial's records on condition that I sign a letter um, saying that I would not use the information contained therein. Um, you know, to harm or tarnish the reputation of France. So 
let's see how well this talk lives up to that promise. Um, right, so kind of Vial goes underground at this time and then resurfaces after World War II in present day Central African Republic in 1947, um, where she successfully campaigned for election to the French Senate. In addition to her tenure as a senator in France, she founded the Association des Femmes de l'Union Française, or the AFUF, or I'll be referring to it as the AFUF, the Association of Women of the French Union. Um, she remained active in French politics until her death in a plane crash in 1953. But if we return for a minute to the day of her arrest in January 1943, Vielle was charged with atteinte à la sûreté extérieure de l'État, and you can see that kind of legal language at the bottom of your screen there, which sort of um, loosely translates to an attack against the safety of the state or an attack against national security. The thing that is interesting about this charge is this. Prior to 1960, atteinte à la sûreté extérieure de l'État largely consisted of one of two crimes. Treason, which referred to acts carried out by a French national against the French state, and espionage, which referred to acts carried out by a foreign national against France. So when Vial was put on trial for espionage, the language that the Vichy regime employed to criminalize her also enacted a disavowal of her French nationality. Vial's experience then shows how the state's silencing of her dissidents was premised on its rejection of her French citizenship. Now, if we bring this forward in time to our present moment, right, you'll recall that in 2016, um, the, you know, at the time, Minister of Justice, Christian Toubira under François Hollande, resigned from her position specifically because of a proposed law to strip French citizenship from any dual citizens who are convicted of terrorism. Now, this is not to say that terrorism and the French resistance are the same thing, but in 2016, when Toubira resigned, as in 1943, when Vielle stood trial for espionage, French citizenship for those already marked as other was understood to be conditional. After World War II, Vielle drew on these experiences of arrest and incarceration to argue for an end to the silencing of those that were deemed subversive in the post-war period. And so in describing the founding ethos of her um, association, the AFUF, she wrote the following. She said, the women who experience the torture of prisons, the horror of concentration camps, the life of the hunted, and who for many years trembled in fear for their parents, their friends, their work colleagues, wanted to bring together all the women of overseas France in the spirit of fraternity to work towards the same goal to allow all women to establish honorable and happy homes in a peaceful atmosphere. Now, I have to admit that Vial's use of the language of fraternity initially bothered me um, for the way that I think it reifies the kind of masculine language of the French Republic, right? But at the same time, it's interesting that it sits right next to this image of maternal work. Um, right? But the move that she makes here is interesting because it reinforces France's, France's national motto, liberty, equality, fraternity, which during wartime occupation was suspended and replaced with travail famille patrie, work family fatherland under the Vichy regime. And so by emphasizing her belonging to Republican France, Vielle envisions a geography of French citizenship that includes here France and its overseas territories and where belonging is premised on a collective contribution to the ideals of liberty and to the goals of post-war rebuilding. But I have to hasten to add that this is not a Republican vision that is premised on a myth of colorblindness, right? So I find that Vial departs from the ideology of the French state that posits that specter of communautarisme or sectarianism as constantly threatening the unified republic. And she disrupts the notion of a universalism that makes no room for the local. Instead, she imagined a composite citizenship that we can kind of piece together across her various writings and speeches during her tenure as a senator. And so the first piece of that composite citizenship comes in a talk that she gave at Hunter College in May 1951, um, in which she positioned herself as both a citizen of France and an African woman. 
And so, you know, in the part that I've sort of circled here in, her, in the newspaper coverage of her talk, Yell argued that, and I quote, there is no pressing move for independence by her people. The constitution of the fourth French Republic guarantees them representation in the French Union and also provides for the regulation of local affairs through local assemblies. And so here she makes a direct claim to French citizenship, invoking the rights and protections of the French state that had until then been denied the colonized. And this for me is what is timely right today, um, is that Vial invokes France's constitutional ideals of equality. But in the Senate, she was always quick to remind her colleagues that France wasn't living up to those ideals. Right? She kept kind of holding France um, to those ideals, particularly in the colonies. And so the citizenship that she envisions also refuses the French colonial project of erasing the cultures and civilizations of the colonized in favor of assimilation into a French culture that is perceived as superior. And this second interrelated piece of her sort of composite citizenship vision comes in a 1948 editorial that Vial wrote for the AFUF journal in which she argued against the colonial project of cultural assimilation as a condition for French citizenship, right? So remember that kind of conditional citizenship in 1943 at her trial, that conditional citizenship in 2016 when Tobiara resigns, right? Um, that is sort of premised on a kind of um, assimilation into a particular idea of a, of a French culture. Um, what Vian says in response is, in our times, we cannot pretend to have a pure civilization. So I lean towards this international advancement that makes man a citizen of the world without at the same time taking away the originality of his homeland. She goes on to call for true civilization, that is the civilization of the masses, that of a people through knowledge of themselves. Once the African comes to know himself, the word évolué will be buried. Vian's discussion of civilizations here is very much a political vision a refusal of France's colonial so-called civilizing mission that postulates the superiority of French culture and civilization to be spread by all means throughout the empire. Now, it's important to remember that Vial wrote these words the same year that Aimé Césaire first drafted the essay that would become Discourse on Colonialism, in which he wrote, a civilization that proves incapable of solving the problems it creates is a decadent civilization. A civilization that chooses to close its eyes to its most crucial problems is a stricken civilization. It is absolutely essential to situate Vial in this intellectual genealogy of theorizing the deadly violence at the heart of colonialism, the violence of civilizations that define themselves through relations of domination and conquest. For Vial, understanding oneself as African did not preclude French citizenship and the right to political representation. So we can see in the way that she's kind of constructing this idea of French citizenship, right? That there's at once the national dimension of claiming a particular kind of belonging in France as she does in her talk at Hunter and the transnational dimension of a composite political identity that transcends the borders of metropolitan France as she articulates in um, her article's notion of global citizenship. But in the same way that Vial's repurposing of the language of fraternity initially troubled me, here too I find myself pausing at this idea of Africans having knowledge of themselves as Africans for the way that it brushes a little too closely to essentialism for comfort. But what I find striking, even in this potentially troubling moment, is the role that Vial imagines for the French state. Vial invokes the constitution of the French Fourth Republic in her talk at Hunter College as providing political representation. But the project of self-definition, of defining collective identity as African or elsewhere in her writing as French, is not the role of the French government. Um, and for me, that's what's untimely, right, even now, is that if we again bring this forward in time to our present for a moment, and I hope that you're not kind of getting like temporal whiplash from our movements back and forth, right, but I think that there, there are connections to be made between past and present, right, if we come to our present, this expansive vision of French citizenship that Vial described in the 1940s and 50s 
remains difficult for many in the French government to grasp today. So just last week, former French Minister for European Affairs, Nathalie Loiseau, shared on social media what she saw to be the decline of France. And I really wish that French government officials would stop giving me material for my talk, but here we are. Um, and so this, this screenshot is taken from um, Liberation that kind of authenticates her, um, her social media post. Um, and you know, feel free to sort of follow along in, in the French. I'll sort of read from my, my screen here um, and translate as I go along for those kind of working in English. And so Nathalie Loiseau says, you know, traveling on, on the train this morning around me, and then she has a list, a tired baby crying a lot um, while its mother remains unmoved. An old man in good health, talking very loudly without wearing his mask, um, and who recounts his strikes. He is retired from the SNCF. A dog that smells like a dog and that's yapping a lot. A teenager, probably Malian, who makes no noise and is wearing his mask. Douce France. In this list of a friend that has gone off the rails, this is my little nod to Gregory Peel's sense of humor in presentations. She's on the train, right? But in this list, right, if you look at the progression, mothers shirk their maternal duties. Workers proudly recount their participation in work stoppage. Dogs smell like dogs. And a Malian teenager follows the rules. And you'll notice the sort of the progression, right? From baby to mother to old man to worker to dog to foreigner. You'll notice the rhetorical proximity between the dog and the Malian teenager. When asked how she knew the teenager was Malian, Yuazu proffered the following explanation. And again, I'm just kind of, um, you know, going to read the second paragraph in italics is, is her quote. Um, I'm going to sort of translate for those working in English. She says, you know, I didn't ask him his nationality. Um, should I have asked him for his papers? But I guessed it very simply because I spoke with him and he was in effect, not French, taken into account his accent, and probably Malian, taken into account the music he was listening to. I have lived seven years in Africa, and I am a fan of the Kora. Had I written he was probably Australian, there would have been no fuss. And so she goes on to, you know, kind of assert that in summary, those who are criticizing me are exposing their xenophobic racism without even realizing it. And this last line for me is what is so fascinating. Mais il y a aussi tous ceux qui ont apprécié et très bien compris. There are those who have understood, right? That there is what is spoken and what is unspoken. So if we return to her original narrative to try to decipher the unspoken or disentangle the spoken from the unspoken, right? What happens in this accounting is the disappearing of everyone else's nationality in a way that makes the Malian teenager hyper visible as not French. Accent and music stand in as markers of difference, unnamed markers of difference, that separate the docile, well-behaved foreigner from the unruly French. What remains unspoken, the greatest disappearing act of all in Loiseau's accounting of who is present in French public space, is the racially coded nature of this language of nationality. After all, as she said, had she said he was Australian, sous-entendu blanc, we wouldn't be making a fuss. It's perhaps not a coincidence that Loiseau's singling out of the teenager's difference occurs in a space of public transit, because it rehearses the many moments in the Black French intellectual tradition when Black French writers or their fictional characters are fixed by the white gaze. It rehearses Aimé Césaire's white women giggling at the ungainly black man on the tram in Cahiers d'un retour pays natal, right? That refrain, il était comique et laid. He was comical and ugly. It rehearses Fanon's tiens, un nègre, look, a negro, from the mouth of a white child that leads to him being given a wide berth on the train, right? Fanon says there are two or three seats next to me. It rehearses the trajectory of Elissa, the elderly Martinican woman protagonist of Paulette Naudal's short story, On Exil, whose madras head tie functions, like the Malian teenager's chora music, as a mark of otherness and draws stares on the bus. In Loiseau's encounter in 2020, Frenchness as whiteness remains unspoken, but haunts the claim of universalism that does not see race, except when it does. 
In the colonial logic at play here, the Malian teenager is everything that douce France should be, an aspiration that, perhaps perversely, he himself can never attain, specifically because he is excluded from French nationality, even when he is held up by virtue of his very otherness as embodying a French ideal. So what does it mean to say Black Lives Matter in this France, in which, as Mme Fatunyang aptly asserted recently, race is everywhere, and at the same time, race is nowhere? For Vial, one can be French and African and Black and claim a multiplicity of cultural and political communities that do not negate one another. She imagined a universalism that made room for the particular, a republic that recognized and respected the local in meaningful ways, rather than subsuming those different locals, right, understood to be geographic, cultural, political, religious communities, right, subsuming them into a supposedly colorblind France. Um, and I'm happy to kind of keep thinking through this with you all in Q&A, but what Vial proposes here is not the benign, toothless multiculturalism that leaves these racial and social categories intact. Right? So as I hope I, I show in my book, she's trying to unravel the colonial production of these categories and imbue them with new meaning. Now, the degree to which she's successful, that is debatable. Where Vial advocated for political representation for all of France's citizens, Suzanne Césaire emphasized the possibility of Black life in the face of state-sanctioned violence and death. And so in, you know, in the interest of time, and because there's relatively more scholarship on Suzanne Césaire than on Jeanne Vielle, I won't go into much of her biography here, but I'm happy to talk more about her life and her work in Q&A if that is of interest. But what I will say about the photograph on your screen, right, and you can see Suzanne Césaire on your in sort of upper left corner, well, my left, um, right, is that it so beautifully and aptly captures the way that I encounter Césaire in the archives. We catch a glimpse of her partially obscured, often connected to Amy, right here, she's the only person looking at Amy, often the only woman in the room, in mid-speech, but we don't have a transcript of all her words, right? We know that Suzanne Cézelle said and did so much more than the seven published essays in Tropique, but we don't have, um, you know, a, a record of all of the things that she did. And so one of the things that I value about having these kinds of conversations that we're having now or will be having when Q&A begins, um, you know, is that I'm able to share some of Cézelle's unpublished writings that remain unpublished, um, partly because of the difficulty of obtaining copyright clearance. Um, and so I'm going to break all the PowerPoint rules and share with you a giant quote from a letter that Suzanne Cézelle wrote to her friend Yasugo Claire in 1944 while she was in Haiti. And I'm going to share with you this quote because I, I want you to hear so much more Suzanne Cézelle's voice than mine. Um, I warned you, it's a giant quote. So in this letter from Haiti, Suzanne Cézelle writes, Vous dirais-je que les conditions de temps de guerre aidant au moment où l'intolérable domination de Vichy exigeait l'évasion sous toutes ses formes? J'ai été assez folle pour rêver d'un retour ou d'une recréation aux Antilles d'un style de vie moderne où se jouerait cette unité de l'homme non séparé. Je voulais trouver des, non pas faire vivre une tradition connue dans le serpent à plumes, mais créer, susciter, forme d'art viable, des objets, des vêtements. Je n'ai plus ce sentiment d'inutilité devant les objets extérieurs qui m'étaient si familiers. Mais ce que j'appellerais le sentiment du toc, le paysage de temps en temps se décroche, se met de côté. Les arbres, même dans un jour de détresse comme celui-ci, où ils ont besoin d'aide, arrivent à être sournois et faux. Et moi, bien entendu, je me sens stupide devant tous ces objets déséquilibrés, incohérents. Moi qui n'ai jamais connu de bombardement, je suis obsédée par des images de guerre, le monde me paraissant vraiment, à certains moments, sens dessus dessous. When I tell you I was heartbroken, when at the last minute, close to publication of the book, 
Sivio's family said I could not use her quotes, but they are well within their right to do so. Um, it's a humongous quote, right? But I want to move through it systematically. The question that we have been working through so far is, what does it mean to say Black lives matter in a country that claims to be colorblind? From solitude's enslavement, trial, and death by hanging, to Jean Vial's arrest and incarceration, to the efforts to silence Asa Traoré's demands for justice, what becomes clear is not only the long history of Black women's resistance of state violence, but also how deadly and traumatic that violence can be. And so if we begin with the bookends of Cézelle's quote, we see the same deadly violence at play, this time in the occupied Antilles during World War II. Cézelle is candid here about the toll that violence takes on her mental health, the constant feed of images of war and death playing over and over in a loop that is familiar to us today a cell phone footage of Black people being brutalized and murdered by police play on a loop. Between those bookends of death, Cézère proposes quite simply life, right? And if you look at the plethora of verbs that she uses here, rever, um, trouver, créer, susciter, right? The, that active process of creation. Cézère's vision for Antillian cultural expression counters the violence and death that prolifer proliferates Antillian history from colonial conquest and slavery to a destructive world war, counters that with vitalism and creation. The colony, a space of conquest, subjugation, and death, is, in Cézère's reimagining, the site of its own regeneration. Significantly, it is neither a space that is swallowed up by the foundational myths of France as expressed in policies of assimilation, nor is it grappling with its beginnings only in terms of displacement, deracination, and fracture. The concept of affirming life and creation in the face of state-sanctioned violence and death is not solely abstract. Concretely, Cézère locates that revitalization in art, clothing, tangible objects. Now, admittedly, Cézère is working in a very different register from Vial, right? She emphasizes the poetic, where Vial focuses on the political. But I see them converging on two points. The first, if you recall Vial's idea of knowledge of oneself as African, right? Put next to here Cézère's idea of the unity of the non-separated man. Both provide interesting frameworks for thinking about plurality as wholeness, and not as fragmentation or division. The second point of convergence that I see is Cézère's desire to counter disequilibrium and upheaval with creativity and life is political, just like Vial's thinking was political, right? And the political nature becomes clear when we consider what the equivalence of the uprooted trees and destroyed landscape she saw in wartime Martinique would be today. The decades long poisoning of Martinican soil and water with a pesticide chlordecone by the white planter class with the blessing of the French government. Throughout Cézère's letter, the violence of wartime ravages not just her mental and even physical health, but also the very landscapes of Martinique and Haiti. And I know that, you know, on this point of natural landscapes and Cézère's kind of eco-critical thinking, um, you know, thinkers like um, like Annie Dominique Curtius and Charlie Bertraille, I think, you know, will, will do this quote so much more justice. Um, but what I find interesting, right, is that for Cézère, the natural landscape was not the only site at which citizenship was to be contested, right, through this affirmation of life in the face of death. The built landscape of European cities, too, were crucial sites for Black creativity. So, in my book, I talk about, um, you know, Suzanne's rereading of Aimé Cézère's Cahier. And so, here I won't go too much into that, but I will just show you briefly what she actually wrote about the poem, right? Again, so much more interesting to hear her voice than mine. So, we're about to get a little bit into the weeds of poetry here. But if you stick with me for a few minutes, we'll try to bring it back, right, to our primary question of what it means to say Black lives matter in France. And so here is a stanza from Cahiers dans notre pays natal, where Aimé writes, Allons, voilà le grand défi et l'impulsion satanique 
et l'insolente dérive nostalgique de lune rousse, de feu vert, de fièvre jaune. It's kind of like a decontextualized, right? I've sort of just taken out this bit of the, the poem. So what is happening in the stanza exactly? For many scholars, the image in the stanza of moons, fevers, and fires moving out of their designated places suggests the negritude poet's destabilization of a supposedly natural order. The idea is that the poet rejects Christianity and westernization, symbolic of global imperialism, by transforming himself into a sorcerer able to command nature and causing the natural element of moons, fires, and fevers to move out of their place, right? And this reading arises from the interpretation of feu vert as green fires. It emphasizes moons, fires, fevers as representing the element of nature that the poet commands and destabilizes in order to signal his opposition to an imperial West. Suzanne Cézère provides a different interpretation of the stanza that focuses less on the natural, organic imagery and more on the poet's use of color. Consequently, she shifts the emphasis from refusal as an act of negating the power of imperialism to refusal as a creative act. And we're starting to see the connection right back to the letter that she wrote from Haiti. And so she says about the stanza, these russet moons, green light, yellow fevers are linked. And the verse evokes for me something of a collapse of the structures of European countries, symbolized by the traffic lights at the crossroads of big cities. The great challenge, the satanic impulse, is the work of Blacks. It is either that they fight, for example, in an anti-colonial war, or that their genius corrupts European rhythms, as we see, for example, in the grotesque explosion of young people in big cities who aspire to recreate the ritual frenzy of African dances, as with the twist. The first time I read this, I had this image of Suzanne Cézère dancing the twist as an anti-imperial praxis, and it just made my heart so glad. Um, but in, you know, in this reinterpretation, right, of Cayu, Cézère shifts the emphasis from indirectly refusing colonialism by destabilizing nature to directly disrupting European ideals. She interprets Fever as green lights rather than green fires. Consequently, she shifts the emphasis from moons, fires, and fevers as symbols of a natural order that the anti-imperialist poets will destabilize to red, green, and yellow as the traffic lights that symbolizes man-made tools of order and control. And I wonder today what Suzanne Tiziel would have made of policing as another of those structures of order and control. The collapse of European structures of order and control occurs at the crossroads of large cities, spaces of intersection at which multiple cultural influences coincide to create new Afro-diasporic art forms. In her rereading of Kaye, the work of liberation is carried out as much through the disruptive explosion of Black genius in European cities as it is through armed struggle. And so we come full circle to Vial's political vision of plurality. In the European setting of Cézère's rereading, we come full circle too, to a reimagining of a space like Paris, the colonial city into which la mulatresse solitude will erupt as a statue in the coming years. Both Vial and Cézère sought to make citizenship a meaningful status and imagined a constellation of multiple political and cultural institutions and communities. For them, French citizenship was not la France tu l'aimes ou tu la quittes. Their writings and speeches allow us to piece together the multiple and sometimes shifting positions that characterize their understanding of what it meant to be African, Antillian, a woman, a citizen of France. Their political visions show that to say black lives matter in France is not divisive sectarianism, but is rather to remake France in its own idealized image of itself. I thank you all for your attention and I'm really looking forward to the conversation and Q&A.
Thank you so much, Annette, for this um, incredibly rich and uh, amazingly synthetic talk. You covered so many things. And um, I'm going to uh, work back and forth with a couple of my own questions. I'm going to take the privilege of moderator and then uh, read off the chat the various questions that are coming in. Just two things to kick us off. Um, this phrase, les vies noires comptes, with which you began. So I was thinking about, uh, first of all, it's, it's a fascinating translation of a phrase that starts in uh, Black American communities and assembly politics. And, you know, in the wake of some very specific events, the um, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, uh, the list sadly goes on, but they're very focused and they're very, um, the, the, and, and, the, and the movement is not so much a singular movement. It takes place in all of these cities and sites where this kind of racial violence has occurred. So they're very site specific in some ways and part of the American political landscape of, um, so what happens then is my, here's my question. When Black Lives Matter becomes uh, Les Vies Noires Comte, um, Comte and Comte implies accountability. Uh, things that matter do um, less explicitly. Um, but what we lose, of course, in, in translation here uh, is the reference that the, the, the double or tri triple entendre, the, the sense of matter as materiality, as embodied, um, uh, embodied violence, and as um, matter in the sense of enjeu, of something that's going to interfere with the, the so-called concerns of the nation that refuses to see these concerns. So uh, it, it implies a kind of demand for recognition. Uh, Comte, uh, Comte, there's, I think, less explicit demand for recognition in that phrase. So part of what fascinated me in your talk was that you were not only talking about what uh, French universalism refuses to see, but also what the, in a sense, the transatlantic relationship um, allows one to hear or not to hear as much, but invites us to start listening to. So, you know, in a sense, this is a, a um, I mean, I heard a, a talk recently by Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak that was discussing some of the relationships that are emerging between the Dalit community and Black Lives Matter activism, um, a kind of transcontinental um, mo movement of solidarity that had a prehistory, but is now being redefined through Black Lives Matter and some of the, the controversies around, say, um, Martin Luther King's appropriation of Gandhian um, nonviolence and, and so on. So it's a long-winded question, but maybe you could just, in a, in a rather informal and pre-associative way, take us through this, this translation in your own view? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a great question. And there's, there's so much to sort of try to try to work through there, right, in terms of what happens, what happens in translation, what happens when, when things travel, um, but at the same time, right, to like you're saying, right, to think about what's happening in France, that's also site specific, right, as, as specific to France's own historical and, and present context. Um, there, so you, you've pointed out in, in really in, important ways, right, some of the things that are lost in translation, right, the, the different um, meanings of matter, but there's also so much that is that is gained or sort of taken on in that shift from from matter to accounting, right, les vies me rencontres, and, and for me, I think that part of the value of that linguistic shift is that assertion of presence, right? So that recognition is happening 
through or is being demanded right through the demand for recognizing presence right so that literally to be counted is to be there to be present in the way that as we see right the sort of erasure the language of colorblindness continues to enact that disavowal that conti counters as present um you know and and so i find i find that les vinois contes is is particularly rich and interesting i also appreciate that you know in addition to what is different about conti versus matter is also that we have noir, you know, versus black, right? And which is that that continued mm -hmm. point of, of contestation around the importation of black as a word in French as a way to sort of distance, right, any discussions of race from a French historical context, right? So um, talking about blackface in France, for example, is going to be routed through the word blackface as opposed to barbouillet, right? And so, you know, you have all these moments where there is a refusal of the French language in order to refuse what is really quintessentially French about the nature of racism that Afro-French people are seeking to counter. And I think mm -hmm. that what les vies noires Kunt does, um, you know, even when it, when it when it loses some of what's happening in English, is to try to is is to rework, right? It's it's demands in a particularly French context that asserts presence and by presence asserts value. And value for me is always a bit of a troubling word, right? But you know, to say something Kunt, you know, si ça Kunt, you know, it matters. It's a value. Black Lives Matter, you know, again, it's it's a value. And value in a kind of a capitalist sense is, is also a bit troubling for me. But I think that here, right, that assertion of humanity that's happening, um, you know, through the affirmation of presence is is very much in line with you know what folks like Suzanne Tezier were thinking about, you know, as as they talked about about um the presence presence of Black people in a broader French sort of geography and historical context. Um, so yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with you that, the, you know, the translation is so fascinating. Um, and, just and that to, both it, versions give us something. Yeah. Just to say what this, your, what the French translation also alerts us to in the US context, if you loosely translated it as count Black lives, um, it takes us directly into some very punctual debates at the moment around the census, literally counting Black BIPOC, you know, constituencies, minorities, immigrants, um, and count, uh, and the vote count. So the whole question of enfranchisement and disenfranchisement. And so it's, I just sort of say this is a, it, it, one phrase like this, which is also a banner, it's a slogan, it's an anthem. It has many rhetorical functions as a, as a form, as a rallying cry for um, disparate global solidarities at the moment, um, has in as an active form of translation, pulls together certain things that are often not put, not placed it together, not seen. So the whole questions that, that you have indirectly explored in, in relation to citizenship and enfranchisement gets kind of drawn back into this question of a translation, uh, a cross-Atlantic translation there. So uh, I don't know if you want to add any last words, but I do want to be mindful to call on uh, some of the people who've been asking questions. But it, uh, first, let me just invite you to make any last comments or, or thoughts. Yeah, I guess I'll just say very briefly, right, it's it's so important that you bring up the census, right, and, and the, the quite literal act of counting, because that's also something that's a point of contest in France, right, is that France quite literally does not count Right, like based on based on race, and so you have no sort of um, racial identity categories on official forms, and that's something that has been, you know, again a point of contact. So to to quite literally say, right, to, to count black lives, that again that active verb that's there, right, it's again pushing back against something that is so absent in France. That's not quite the case. It's not quite as absent in the U.S., where you know you sort of have boxes to check. And certainly both of those approaches have their pitfalls. But to say, you know, to count pushes back against. Uh, again, a very specifically French form of erasure in the refusal to recognize and acknowledge right, certain identity categories. 
Great, thanks. Let me turn now to some of the questions. The first one is from Geneviève Pousselier. Um, she says, thanks for this great talk. Do you see robust differences between the theories of these Black women and those of Black male writers and activists of their time? How does their gender impact their thought, if at all? Yeah, that's that. Thank you for that question. It's such an important one. Um, it's a it's a question that I struggle with often because on one hand, right, I I'm always sort of keen to to emphasize that that Black women thinkers had things to say about gender, and that Black women thinkers had things to say about things that were not at all right about gender. Um, and so I, I struggle kind of with that with that relationship all the time. Um, for for Cezelle and Yel specifically, so I'll give you an example, right, about how 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 their their gender ex impacted their experience as they were sort of formulating the thought that I have shared here. And so Suzanne Cezelle, if we if you recall that sort of long quote from her letter in Haiti, where she gives us this beautiful right, fascinating imagery of natural landscapes that are destroyed as they bear the brunt of colonial violence, right, state-sanctioned violence in the war period. That comes in the middle of her letter. At the beginning of that letter, the same thing is happening with the trees. The trees are being uprooted, right, the landscape is being destroyed, this time by a hurricane. And she's writing there specifically in her capacity as a mother, who has left her children in Martinique in the care of relatives, right? So her children are kind of spread across. The two youngest were um, with her mother, the two older ones were with her um, brother-in-law. And Suzanne Cézère had accompanied Aimé Cézère to Haiti to work on this kind of like French diplomatic mission. Um, and whereas Aimé Cézère was paid, she was not paid, right? So she's left her children, she's left her temporary job, right, in uh, Martinique and moved to Haiti to do this work. She's giving us that beautiful, fascinating, rich intellectual framework of kind of eco-poetics, right, eco-critical analysis of the violence of colonialism on the landscape at the same time as she's experiencing that violence as a mother who's afraid for her children, children left behind on an island as a hurricane is approaching, right? And so she's confiding to Yatsugo Claire that she's really worried about what's gonna happen to her children, right, while she's not there. Um, you know, and so, and so, and, and I find that there was always this sort of, um, the, the the gendered experiences, right, that the w women thinkers were were living through and navigating and negotiating, it's always kind of hovering on the margins, even when it is not present, right, or centralized in their writing. So Suzanne Cezelle doesn't really write here about women in this letter, um, right, but that's one of the moments where you can see that connection, right, between the violence that is playing out in that results in her own fear and the violence that is playing out on the landscape in that moment, right? So that, that's one of the ways. Um, Jeanne Vial was a lot more um, kind of explicit about her emphasis on uh, women as, um, you know, the, the ones who would be, um, who would enact democracy, right, in Africa. And so she, in the talk at Hunter, and a portion, a portion that I didn't read out of the quote, right, she talks about women as the ones who would go on to carry out the work of democracy. Um, so that's the role that she saw for women in her own political work. She advocated a lot for women's education. And I talk about that quite a bit in the book. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is that she goes underground, like I said, in her bio and then surfaces. And I don't know where she gets the money, but purchases like two high rises, right, in French cities specifically for women and girls from French colonies who are coming to study in France, right? Again, for her, ed women's education was going to be central in the way that she thought about their central role in citizenship. Um, so, you know, those are, those are just two examples of the way that their, um, you know, gender impacted the ways that Suzanne and Vian thought about citizenship um, and, and the role of, of Black life and creativity in the French context. Great, thank you. So uh, here's a question from Hannah Leppingwell, uh, and it follows a bit on the first one. In what ways, to what extent, did sexuality play a role in these forms of Black resistance, especially for Césaire? So that is a question that I cannot answer, <laughs> right, because Césaire is, actually all of the women that I worked on are really tight-lipped about that, right? So. Cézère, you, you can find glimpses of her thinking through a sort of a, a, a gendered lens, a kind of a gender analysis in her work, 
Um, but there's certainly nothing that I have seen where she addresses sexuality in any kind of concrete way. Um, and the same thing for Viel. Um, and so those are not specifically the writers that I would turn to, to think about those questions. Um, I find that those, those start to be taken up in more fascinating and robust ways, um, you know, a little bit in the post-colonial period with a, a publication like Awa, Nalidi de la Femme Noire, for example, where women from all around the French colonies, right, from Africa, then Swiss, et cetera, had their voices merging in this textual space to, to talk about womanhood in ways that included sexuality. That wasn't really the case at the time that Cézanne and Vial were writing. Uh, but, you know, but if there are any other examples, I'm really happy to, to learn more about those. But, you know, especially for Cézanne, she doesn't really address that in her writing. Okay, here's a question from Greg Pierrot. How do you see the many quarrels that have opposed Black French rappers and French politicians since the late 1990s, Ministère Amère, Nick Conrad, etc., illustrating the Suzanne Césaire comment that you singled out? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because, right, Suzanne Césaire is, is talking about about you know like like black black creativity particularly in the realm of pop sort of popular culture right um and and art forms and what's fascinating to me about the example of the twist is that it's a dance that is very participatory right it's not like a thing that a person performs on a stage it's something that is a kind of a collective right um act of performance and i think that that's partly what is so powerful and disruptive about the twist in that moment. And that is what is so disruptive about, right, um, a, 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 an art form like, 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 like rap in France now. So, you know, I'm always making the joke, you know, like how many people are in Section that so like there are just so many of them, right? But, but the, the idea here is that, that that collective, right, for Cézanne is already disruptive. And then the use of the art form in ways that leave nothing sacred, right? Like quintessentially French culture, what is understood to be white French culture is not sacred for rappers. So um, there's, a, there's a really interesting episode of En Sol Majeur on LAC, uh, for example, where um, Yusufa kind of like does this, um, re he recites a passage of Corneille, right? So like a 17th century tragedy over a beat by Dr. Dre, right? Like there's nothing sacred, right? Like, I can just see that Camille Francais is like shriveling up inside, but but that there, that nothing is is untouchable, um, and that that is disruptive, that is subversive, and that is threatening. And I think that for Suzanne Cézanne, that's the power, right? It is that fusion, it is that plurality in ways that that do not leave what we're told is sacred as sacred. Um, and so that's one of the ways I think that connects her example of the twist with the you know the many quarrels that that you. Um, that that you're asking about here in in French rap, you know that rap is going to perform um, some of that disruption that that CDLC is happening in um in 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 the twist, right? So notice that the word she says is to corrupt, right? To corrupt French rhythms, uh, European rhythms. Now, a comment from Daniel Shore brings us back to the first image and to our earlier discussion about the phrase. Uh, he says that in the picture you showed at the beginning, it didn't say Les Guinois Contes, but Black Lives Matter. Maybe the French version wasn't forceful enough. Um, I mean, I think that the two, the two do different things, right? So um, the, the, when you look at photographs of the protests, you see signs that are alternately in, in French or in English. So you'll see sometimes Black Lives Matter and you'll see sometimes Les Vignes Comptes. And you know, it's that, it's that sort of traveling of, um, of ideas, is that transformation, is that site-specific you know, demand and revendication. So I wouldn't say that the French version isn't forceful enough so much as you know, it just it just does something different, right? It functions differently from what the what the American version is is doing. Um, and it's interesting for me to see that sort of bilingual nature of what is really a transnational movement, because what it is responding to, what it is countering, even when those um, sort of elements of imperialism function or look different in the United States versus in France, continues to operate on the same logics of white supremacy, right? And so it's interesting to, to see that interplay that's happening there.
Um, just a, a point of um, curiosity, uh, since we're still on this, uh, was there a lot of pushback in the media in, and the white media particularly against um, I, against the phrase well, in, in either English or in French? Uh, because, I, you know, it, it, I had this flashback when I was working on French colonialism and I went into a bookstore in Paris and asked to where the Fanon was. And the bookseller said, uh, "No, on on s'intéresse pas à ça en France." You know, it was like it just foreclosed casually, um, and I, things have clearly shifted since that moment. Uh, but the point is that the reception of post-colonial studies, what it represented for me, was the the absolute cluelessness and total out of kind of initial refusal. You, you, you mentioned the, question, the theme of refusal and made me think of Tina Camp's uh, book that discusses the black refusal and um, but, this, but there, this was a complete white refusal. <laughs> yeah, I mean refusal is there, there's been so much pushback right and and the pushback is the same as what you're describing in that moment where you know you're told in the bookstore that Fanon doesn't interest us. Oh, France, but it's not, it doesn't interest me in this bookstore, right? It's a national refusal. It's national. Um, and, right, and, and so you have that same kind of refusal that's happening here, right? That this is un-French, right? So that Black Lives Matter is a specifically US importation yeah. that is misplaced because it misunderstands the French context in which racism doesn't exist because race doesn't exist, right? That racism is a specifically American phenomenon, mm -hmm. which is astounding to me, right? Because it's, it's so fascinating to see someone like Aimé Cézéel get a, a state burial um, and, and, a, and a, a, a sort of a reenactment of a really interesting version of negritude, right? That is all about a sort of an aesthetic revendication that completely does away with the political, you know, mm -hmm. impetus, impetus behind that aesthetic, you know, um, reclamation, um, you know, and so Cézéel gets a state funeral and there's, you know, reenactments of la tragédie du Christophe, etc. And there's nothing from discours to le colonialisme because mm. that is the text where Césaire really puts his finger on the pulse. I mean, he puts it on the pulse of all of his work, right? But, but that's a text that speaks directly to France. Um, and so it's fascinating to hear that racism or anti-racism or Black Lives Matter is an importation into a context where racism doesn't exist when you have people like Cézanne writing in the 40s and 50s, um, where you have Paulette Nardel writing in the 20s and 30s. Um, and France, you know, recently, again, named an avenue after Jeanne et Paulette Nardel, but you're kind of wondering, well, what, it is, what is it that you're recognizing if not their writing specifically about French racism? Um, you know, and so th there is a lot of pushback. Um, and I think that, you know, folks like uh, Mam Fatunyang and Mabula Sumao and, and Rokar Diallo, right, show very clearly the relationship between what's happening in France and the United States, but also understanding and rooting what's happening in France in a French history and context. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question from Ryan Schaller. Um, who first, thanks you warmly for such a truly fascinating presentation. Uh, and loved in particular how you pulled in so many references to Jen, Jen Bial through archival work. He would love to hear more about how you went about locating the sources and finding stories of Black women who resisted French imperialism and universalist myth, especially when these stories aren't always recognized by France. Yeah, so well, first of all, hi, Ryan. Um, Ryan was, was my student at University of Michigan and is now at NYU, so I love these connections. Um, but that, that's a great question, right, because the, the archival work for, for this project was, was really interesting. Like, you, you had to go everywhere. But I, I love this quote from Hortense Spillers in, um, you know, this, this documentary um, that they did at Vanderbilt where she says you can, you can study the history of Black people and end up studying the whole world, right? Like you can, you can begin with Black women as your point of departure and end up going everywhere, um, you know, so that, you know, someone like Vial, for example, is taking you to archives in Paris, in Aix-en-Provence, in Marseille, um, you know, in parts of Central Africa. So there are archives I couldn't access and there are ones that I had more access to. Um, but essentially, 
how how my process of locating these sources was really trying to be attentive to what was happening in the first archive I visited because that always led me to the next one, right? So I'm going through, for example, Eslanda Robeson's papers, you know, at Howard, and I find a letter from Eugenie Ebuetel, who was a French Guianese, um, you know, senator, um, you know, who, who lived in Central Africa. And so, you know, you have all of these really interesting connections that begin to emerge as you're working in one archive that necessitate that you keep moving because these women kept moving sometimes out of necessity and sometimes because they understood the importance of transnational connections right to the project of citizenship that they were imagining that always always refused the nation state as intact and sacred and that always tried to go beyond the nation state right as that kind of privileged mode of belonging um you know so that was that was kind of my process is you just got, start, kind of get started in one place and that woman's connections lead you on to the next place um the other part of the process was as as you no doubt notice a lot of the women um you know that i write about in the book are connected to famous men right so to find eslanda robeson you need to go to paul robeson's archive to find eugenie ebuetel you need to go to felix ebuet's archive which is itself a sub archive of Charles de Gaulle's archive right so like there you have to kind of peel back all of these national layers right until you get to these women who are often subsumed within these broader stories and then you know from there you sort of zoom out to figure out well how are they also commenting and contributing to these broader national narratives um you know so i'll kind of stop there because i can go on and on about archives but you know that was sort of the it felt like it like peeling back an onion complete with the tears right but it felt like peeling back an onion to get to what was really at the heart um you know of, of these sort of archival constructions was there a lot on Vial in the, in the parliamentary records? Yeah, so Vial is so interesting. In the, in the French Senate um, uh, sort of archives library, um, you know, there, there, there are folders and files about the work that she did specifically in the Senate. So her political work is visible there, along with this really fascinating painting of her that just sits in the Senate library when you go, regardless of what you're looking for to, to you know, to do research on, Vial is there when you enter. Uh, but her personal life, that gets a lot harder to, to find, um, you know, because that falls kind of outside of the Senate archives. Um, but yeah, you just kind of sit in the Palais de Luxembourg in Paris on, you know, the Vaugirard and, and there's, there's Jean Vial's work. It's really fascinating. Wow. Um, there's a question from Karina Lopez. I wondered if in your research you came upon the contacts that César and Vial may have had with thinkers from your other European colonies, the British ones, for example. Yeah, um, I mean, Vial, Vial had, had um, really interesting conversations with Eslanda Robeson, right, who, who I mentioned before. Um, so, you know, if, because your question is specifically asking about English, um, there's this really beautiful moment where Eslanda Robeson talks about going to um, Central African Republic and meeting with Jean Vial, um, you know, for, for coffee. And um, Vial gives her a silk shirt with ivory buttons as a gift. And Robeson gives Vial a Revlon lipstick as a gift, right? And there's this really these like these two chic women just sitting in this like capital city, um, you know, in Central Africa, exchanging these gifts, but also making connections that would become also political connections, right? Because during that conversation, they were also talking in French and in English about independence, about the French Union, um, you know, and about Vial's, Vial's work eventually, right? Vial would work um, in the UN and would contact Eslanda Robeson when she comes to, to New York to try to renew those connections. Um, you know, so Robeson is one person who connects all of these, um, all of these, most of these women. Suzanne Cedell's connections, again, a little bit harder to find because I find her a lot more in Martinique and Paris and to some extent in Haiti. Um, but, you know, one of the people that comes to mind for sure are, are the Robesons as, as one of the connections. Uh, we should probably begin to wind down, but I have a, a fairly long question from Melanie Bavaria. Um, she says, this is more in line with the book than the talk, but since the talk also centered around Césaire, can you speak a bit about Césaire's vision for Caribbean citizenship? 
In your book, you show that this vision of Caribbean citizenship is explicitly posited against not only French imperial citizenship and belonging, but also American imperialism, perhaps even more so in Haiti, which is the moment when she considers this. Was there an attempt to realize this vision or engage with regional transnational trans-imperial networks and debates on these questions? Obviously, at the same time as Cesar is thinking about future models of plural citizenship for France, so are Anglophone Caribbean activists rethinking the nature of their decolonization options. To what extent was Cesar actually realizing this regional possibility in terms of her engagement with other regional Caribbean thinkers, perhaps across imperial or linguistic boundaries? That's a, a, a lot of different questions. So um, you'll, I can invite you to seize on part of it or as much of it as you, you'd like to approach. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess, you know, because you've kind of alerted us to, to the time, I'll, I'll try to be, to be succinct in my response. Um, this for me is, maybe I'll be blunt and say one of the failures that I see in Cezelle's thinking. Um, I, I wish, and you can't, you know, kind of impose your own politics on people that you study, but I wish that there had been more possibility for Césaire to think about citizenship outside of a French legal and political framework. Um, so in the Caribbean, she's thinking about Caribbean cultural belonging but French political citizenship, which is which does its own thing, right? It's kind of decolonial-ish, certainly anti-colonial in its own way, right? Um, but it doesn't quite go as far as to envision um, a kind of like a, a pan-Caribbean, you know, political, um, you know, sort of a, a alliance or configuration. And there are reasons for that, right? It's, it's the specter of the United States as constantly threatening that possibility. Um, and so Césaire, like Aimé Césaire, chose to cast her lot with France in the same way that a lot of the women in the book chose to cast their political lot with France, even when they um, asserted their kind of particular and specific histories and cultures within that um, French, French model. Um, but I would have loved to see like Suzanne Césaire and Claudia Jones right like like get like get together and 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 think through and and grapple with with certain things um so you know that's that's one of the things that i think is, is was maybe a missed opportunity um but the realities of colonialism i think deliberately orchestrates the missing of that possible connection i'm going to have um take just one last question and then indulge myself with one final question for you myself um this is from jocelyn gardner Thanks so much for your presentation. Going back to the semantics of matter versus conté, I am wondering how you interpret the use of conté in relation to a brutal calculus of how slaves were counted in ledgers. Is the present use of conté subverting colonial logics? What does it mean to count, but also to have been counted as non-human? That is such an absolutely crucial question, right? The limits, the limits of language, the limits of translation, right? The limits of the linguistic tools that are available. Um, and so, and so, you know, like I said, when when Emily first asked the question, you know, is that Conte is also troubling in a capitalist sense, right? And, and and particularly when you think about the roots, right, of what is troubling there, you know, as as you've pointed out, is what it means to be counted, you know, in in, in terms of slavery. Um, I, I, I honestly cannot speak to what what Afro-French activists are doing or working with Conte, right? I, I can tell you what Conte says to me, but as a as a reader, as as a spectator, et cetera, um, is that is that to to be counted works in different ways, right? So it might be that sort of difference that someone like Aimé Cézelle tried to articulate or that Sango and the negative poet tried to articulate between assimiler et être assimilé, right? To assimilate and to be assimilated. That the, the central note of that process is agency. It's who is doing the assimilating. In the same sense here, who's doing the counting, right? Is that to assert that I count as human 
it's a very different process than to be counted as property or chattel, right? Um, and so, you know, certainly it, it, it reminds us of that violence, brutal history in the same way that negritude and incorporating le mot negre also reminds us of the brutal, violent history that the, the movement itself, right, is countering by, right, sort of incorporating that word, that violent word. And I think that Conte here can work in a similar way by asking us to think about agency, who is counting versus who is being counted, and also asking us to reckon with the violence that is embedded in the word, even as the word seeks to counter that violence, right? So that's maybe how I would, I would, I would approach, you know, thinking through Conte in that way. Uh, so just a very brief comment on this incredibly important topic. I mean, I think you raise here questions of the approach of someone who's operating out of a kind of literary formation, but has a very historical foundation. And a lot of it seems to me is the, is the balance or the, the kind of um, juggling back and forth between the, the strict historical usages and the desire to kind of pay attention to the specific contexts in which something arises, whether it's a political document or a, a historic summit or, um, a phrase that was used in in a moment following post-war debates, you know, that, that, that you have this, on one hand, this imperative to attend to the specifics of historical usage. And at the same time, as people train in literary thinking, we overhear, we overhear. And part of what I've gleaned from this wonderful talk is the, the way in which um, there's this play between rescuing what has not been heard on the one hand, and all the nuances in phrases that are, or even, you know, slogans or um, the, 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 the triad, liberté, fraternité, égalité, um, these words that have almost ceased to mean or resonate because they are part of a, of a doxa of universalism and republican ideology. And it seems to me part of what's fascinating is this dialectic between a kind of historical rigor, a desire to restrain your, your, your ear from running away with all these different usages and yet to open your ear to hear how these things have played out in a kind of transnational echo chamber. Uh, so I really appreciated that. And, I, and I, my final question to you, um, is how have you positioned yourself as an, both an activist, a historian, in relation to publics that are um, in Africa, that are in pure academia, that are for more gen general public in journalism? How do you negotiate these different publics and um, places of address in your work? Yeah, that is that is a difficult question um, <laughs> because it's something that I'm I'm still working through. I think it's a it's a constant process of becoming for me, right? So what is what is what is the purpose of our scholarship? What 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 motivates the work that we do? Um, I would say very simply that so I. I, I like to stay in my lane. I'm, I'm a lit scholar. I'm, you know, I, I keep kind of, you know, finding myself in, in, in historian spaces. Um, but, but my methodology, because it's so primarily literary in certain kinds of ways, um, I think what that allows me to do is to really very simply ask the same question over and over again, right? Is in this particular moment, how is language being used to create meaning, um, right? And then to sort of position that response based on you know the audience or the public that i'm that i'm addressing so one concrete example is you know i've been writing a little bit for for public um audiences as you as you you mentioned in your introduction you know my my piece on health post um uh the conversation all this year etc and it demands a very different kind of thinking i can't do any of the throat clearing or the hedging or the cowering behind so many footnotes etc and all of these other scholars said this don't come from me type of right gestures that i'm so used to academic writing even there I shouldn't be doing that right but 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 there there's a kind of an economy of words that is necessary when writing for a public because we have been bombarded by so much information on a daily basis and I'm trying to work through what that economy of words means for the stakes of the work that we do so Suzanne Cézère said in her letter that I quoted earlier today that you know I want to be lucid 
right, that what she desired most of all amidst all of the upheaval was clarity and lucidity. And that's something that I'm still working to that I think is my way of addressing the various public, positioning myself in different conversations. It's a constant search for clarity and lucidity among so much obfuscation that that is our reality in the present moment. Um, so you know that's the mode that I'm I'm, I'm looking to work in. I'm looking to hone and sharpen and perfect. But clarity and lucidity are my sort of my my mantras in response to <laughs> liberty, equality, fraternity. So there we go. Well, the, your talk today was a model of clarity and also a very thought provoking. Uh, no, you know, going to the places where there aren't so many easy answers uh, or pre-existing formulas. And I personally will just like to thank you for such a rich and wonderful presentation. And um, I only wish we could be in person and offering you a reception afterwards. For those who would like to rehear some of this uh, presentation tonight, it will be available on the NYU Maison Française YouTube channel. It was recorded, um, not immediately, but in the next few weeks it will be up and running. So I hope you can tell people who you may know in the, those in the audience who um, found it as stimulating as I, that, that you could alert friends, other scholars in our field to um, tune into this in, at a subsequent time. But for now, let me say huge thanks and we hope this can be continued as a dialogue. Thank you so much, Emily. I really appreciate it. <laughs>